Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Mike Slade. My colleague Dan Robotham will be up in a moment to uh, talk about another part of the work. The work we're going to talk about now, though, is uh, started in a clinical encounter. I was a consultant in a community forensic team working with people with psychosis and criminal justice system contacts. And I was working with a guy, and I, th I could really see him in employment. And I said, have you ever thought about getting a job? And he said, well, what's the point? Why would anyone employ someone like me? So high anticipated discrimination. Now we know from the evidence, one of the things that can counter anticipated discrimination is meeting someone else who is a peer, who is like the person, but a bit further on in their recovery journey. Unfortunately, in our, in our team, we didn't have any peer workers, people where lived experience is an essential job requirement. And it set me thinking, my goodness, there are so many stories of recovery that are out there in the world about people's journey through and beyond living well with mental health problems. And here's this guy who has no access to any of them. And we know that stories change people. So NEON is about stories. Um, it's a program grant, so it's trying to be interdis interdisciplinary. And the goal, essentially, is to make accessible to other people recorded recovery narratives, recorded recovery stories as, as a resource. So we're broadly doing three things. We're creating the world's largest database of people telling their story about recovery in the context of mental health. Then we're going to develop an intervention using that database, and then we're going to evaluate the, the, uh, the intervention. So what's the database, the repository going to look like? Well, firstly, it's going to build to use existing stories that are already out there. Um, so drawing, for example, from YouTube channels or um, existing rep repositories like the Scottish Recovery Network, and also new stories that we will either be soliciting. So for, at the moment, we're doing interviews with 120 people who come from groups that tend not to be represented in the public story. So for example, people living well with psychosis outside the mental health system. And also giving the opportunity for people to donate their story. So that's how we're going to create the repository. There are some interesting issues. So for example, um, if you put your story on a YouTube channel, can we just hoover it up? And um, what about if you put it on a blog? Can, can we just hoover it up? And there are different answers legally to different platforms where people choose to put their stories. Similarly, it's a well accepted norm in, in qualitative research that if you're reporting something someone has said, you anonymize third party information. So for example, if someone is talking about Dr. Bloggs from um, a particular named hospital was awful to me, you, you censor out those, those elements. If we take someone's story and just put it up on our, on our platform, um, we are not liable for the content. If by contrast we redact out Dr. Bloggs, we become liable for the content because we have exercised editorial control. So our effort to anonymise may make us legally liable for content in a way we wouldn't be if we didn't try to. So interesting legal challenges. There are also interesting ethical challenges. The first one about what constitutes consent. If I make my story public, is it consenting for other people to use it? Well, it's clearly consenting for other people to access it, but... Is it different, putting it on a different platform? And what about the question of rejection? We, we will, for example, not include some stories, and we'll have various transparent criteria, but are there risks of harm that we create by someone offering their story and then perceiving that we reject it? So there are, there are challenges aplenty. There's also technical challenges around um, data security, and uh, can we make, for example, use of the ability to provide subtitles in 150 languages automatically? What a great way of making an intervention more accessible. So what will the intervention look like? Um, we're going to characterise the narratives because they're pre-recorded, they're fixed. So we're going to have a, a measure called Norse to identify key elements of people telling their story. We're going to then find out something about the individual who is using the intervention. So for example, the person living with psychosis. And then we're going to try and match them using a machine learning algorithm and develop a, a good human-computer interaction for them to use it. Now, if that sounds a bit abstract, let me give a metaphorical sort of um, thing. What we're doing is we're creating a dating website. But instead of love, we're trying to create hope. So when you go on the website, you tell the, thing, the computer a bit about yourself, uh, who you're looking for, what kind of person you are, and then it matches you to someone that it thinks might be a good match. That's what we're trying to do, but generating hope for a positive future instead of love. So 
when someone uses the intervention, what they'll be doing is going on, provide some information, and then they can choose to be matched or they can browse the, the narrative set. And then we'll refine the matching algorithm using a rating of hope promotion for that individual at the end of their exposure. So the evaluation, just briefly, will be a, a good quality randomized control trial. Um, we've got some challenges, for example, sh why are we not including people who live in Australia? Um, the evaluation timeline is a standard problem of how, how will we have a, 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 an interface that still looks modern when we have to fix it th for evaluation purposes. And also, is the NHS the right route to market? I was having a conversation earlier with someone about what the implementation strategy was for Amazon. I'm not sure there is one. Not in the same way that we've been using it today. So, so with that, let me hand over to Dan. Thanks, Mike. My name's Dan Robotham. I'm the head of research at the McPinn Foundation, and we're a, a charity based in London. Um, and the idea of the McPinn Foundation is to improve research by helping people with experience of mental health problems or using mental health services um, get into research and, and, and sort of be researchers, if you like. Uh, we also do lots of PPI, patient and public involvement stuff as well, um, which is, and we're blending two of those approaches with this particular project, or at least that's what, we, that's what the long-term aim is. So lived experience um, of mental health problems is uh, it's all, all over this study, but in sometimes in quite subtle places. So firstly, uh, members of the research team themselves, it's quite a big study, uh, will have lived experience of mental health problems. Some of those uh, explicitly, so it's, a member, it's part of their job title. Other people implicitly, so it's just something that they bring to the role. We also have a lived experience advisory panel, which I'll talk a little bit on my next and final slide. Um, and someone used this phrase actually earlier. I'm glad they used it on the video that we heard, a critical friend. So the LEAP is a critical friend to the study. It provides advice and guidance for the researchers to improve and develop their study. Um, we're going to have three LEAP meetings per year. We've had one back in October. The next one is in February. Um, and the, the, uh, one of the bit early bits of feedback that we had was around co-producing or co-developing, let's say, uh, the agendas for the LEAP me meetings in advance with members of the LEAP and taking it in turns for LEAP members to um, co-develop uh, the agenda for the next LEAP meeting. So sort of really working the, the lived experience angle in there as well. Uh, and of course, throughout this, we have to reflect on the impact of what lived experience or expertise from experience is actually doing on the study itself. So the LEAP, I'll just skip through this because I'm conscious of time. Um, it's, it's, it's 10 members, uh, mainly in the East, East Midlands, and they've all used mental health services in the past. And probably even more importantly, they've all got an interest in narratives and stories. And I've done many projects, I've been involved in many projects where uh, um, lived experience, expertise from experience is a part of it. And this project's a bit of a dream to work on because everyone is interested in stories and narratives. And some of the members of the LEAP have, uh, they're, they're quite, um, they've, they've told their story, they've published books, they've published self-help animal, um, animals, manuals on this, on this topic. Other members of the LEAP have never, have never thought about it. Some of them have done YouTube videos. But, so there's a real mixture of, of, of experience there and levels of experience, which I think is really important because we don't just want the same people uh, um, describing their, their stories. So that interest in narratives and stories is very important. Um, and, and the early things that the LEAP's been doing, some of these are quite simple things, as you might expect. We've only had one meeting so far. So, for example, advising on the ethics for the repository itself, uh, informing on the content, jargon busting, stuff like that. But we are starting to think about more sophisticated ways in which LEAP members can be involved in this study. Uh, for example, recently, uh, two of the members uh, were involved in helping the, the researchers on the study with their, with their training, uh, with their qualitative interviewing skills uh, for this particular the context. You can see the ground rules up there. I've put them up warts and all as they stand right now. Um, just to see this is, this is what we developed in the meeting itself. So to, to finish off, I think um, I'd like, it, it like I think I'd like you to think all, all to think about when stories have affected you. Uh, when, when you've had a penny drop moment uh, from a story or a narrative or something that you've heard um, 
in the background or it was something that you've read. And when that's, that's had some lasting consequence for you about your, uh, your ability to deal with um, a, a, a mental, uh, well, ability to um, improve your mental well-being. And this is really what this project's about for me. For me, technology is not universal. As there's been lots of talk about the digital divide here and things like that. Well, stories and narratives are universal. So for me, this is the essence of this project and uh, something that I'd like to explore more with the LEAP members themselves as we, as we continue. Thank you. <laughs>